Um, our speaker, Eric, Eric Ellis, as you'll see, is the title of his talk, and you've probably seen it in the, in the uh, promotional materials we've put out there, Donuts to Dynamite, Using Curiosity and Flexibility to Thrive. And I did verify that donuts is actually the food. I thought maybe he was doing some military vehicle donuts out in the, in, in the desert, but that's not what he's talking about. So, and he told us some stories as we prepared for this. It'll be fascinating. Let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. He received his BS in mechanical engineering here from BYU, and then he went on to get an MBA from Santa Clara University, which for many of you will also be a great path that you can take to enhance your undergraduate engineering education. He then also completed some executive leadership coursework at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Early in his career, he spent six years at the Donaher Corporation of, uh, portfolio of companies, and during that time, he was really able to hone his leadership skills for lean enterprise, which is an important topic in many of the industries that you will go out to support. Then he served as president of L3 Communications, now L3 Harris, in the Fusing and Ordnance Systems Division. And then he subsequently served as the senior vice president and general manager at General Dynamics Ordnance and Tactical Systems. So you can see he spent a career basically learning how to blow things up. And there at General Dynamics, he led a $1 billion precision systems business unit and assumed responsibility for all of the functions of that business. That's quite impressive. Uh, he currently resides here in Utah with his wife, Lydia, in South Jordan, Utah, and he enjoys spending time on the ski slopes and in the mountains. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to our speaker. Oh, excuse me, before I do that, I need to announce our benediction, Cassie Larimer, who is also from our chemical engineering program, will offer the benediction. Now, please join me in extending a warm welcome to our speaker, Eric Ellis. Well, thank you. It's great to be back on campus. Um, as uh, Dr. Jensen mentioned, this is where I started my engineering uh, career. And it was actually the very first class I attended was in the old auditorium in this room. It was Dr. Fox teaching American heritage. And we didn't have air conditioning back then, so that's how old I am. Um, this building was about 85, 90 degrees in, in uh, the last week of August. So first, I'd like to say why I do what I do and why many of us do what we do. It's, it's about family. It's about supporting our family. It's about creating bonds and strengthening those bonds throughout our lives. And if we're lucky enough, we find a career that we also enjoy while we do that. But family is where it's at. I'm fortunate enough to have two of my children here with me, Annie, who gave the uh, opening prayer, and Calvin, who is a student up at Ensign College, um, really privileged to uh, watch them continue in the, uh, in the church schools as I was fortunate enough to. So I want to thank you all for being here. To paraphrase Brigham Young, you know, the founder of the school, time is the only inheritance we receive from God. And what we choose to do with that time is really uh, the ultimate decision that we have because the only thing we're given in this life is time. And so I appreciate you spending the next 35 minutes with me and I hope you find it profitable. So I'm gonna go back just uh, one slide. Wanna, so we have, wanna share a little video. It's got some music, it's kind of fun. Just shows some of the products I've been privileged to work on throughout my career. So I'll go ahead and start that.
So that was just a glimpse of what I've spent the last 28 years doing, but my career started somewhat, uh, somewhat curiously. Um, as I mentioned, I did my bachelor's here at Brigham Young University. I took two years off, served a mission in Taiwan, learned to speak Chinese. That was fascinating for me to go from uh, you know, an English speaking background, really struggling in high school in French. I got a C minus in my French class all two years. Um, went to Taiwan and got to learn to speak Chinese, something that has no common ground with the English language. And it was, it was a fascinating time and a, and a great opportunity to get to know a different culture. That led me into my first job. As I was graduating here, I'd had a daughter. She was my graduation gift. She was born the night of my last final. And uh, so I was nervous. I was a new father, concerned about taking care of a family. And there was a company on campus that was looking for a Chinese speaking mechanical engineer. And there were, I think, two of us, one of the guys from China and then myself. And, and so I interviewed with the company, not knowing what they made, what they did. Turns out they were a donut machine manufacturer and they wanted to expand their market in China. And they said, we want you to be the face and we want you to go help us figure out how to do that. I was fascinated, the opportunity to use my language skills, the opportunity to travel, um, and we'll get into some of, the, some of the challenges that came with that, but I decided to go make donuts. And uh, following that, got a little bit tired of the Seattle rain, um, decided to move down to San Francisco with the family, and another kind of improbable career turn, but something I was fascinated by was the recovery of information systems after a flood or a fire. And we had a family friend that I'd grown up knowing and he was looking for a, a manager for his West Coast business. And so I became a storm chaser looking for disasters and we'll talk about some of the learnings there. Another bit of an improbable turn, I'd done about a two week assignment for a company when I was a student here evaluating CAD systems. This was when CAD was just coming into the forefront. People were moving from paper to digital. And I'd worked for this company, Special Devices Incorporated, did a report on which CAD system would work best for them. They called me up and said, do you wanna design things that blow up? I said, do I go to jail if I do it? They said, no. I said, okay, great. So the opportunity to blow things up and not go to jail really appealed to me. So, jumped in there. That company was acquired by a larger company Pacific Scientific Energetic Materials Company that was a subsidiary of a corporation called Danaher. And Danaher Corporation was one of the early adopters in the 1980s of lean manufacturing, studying from the Toyota Motor uh, Company, how they built cars and applying that to industrial businesses. So Pacific Scientific acquired SDI, moved over there, became engineering director for them as part of this integration of the two companies. And then they paid for me to get an MBA they sent me to Santa Clara and they said, we'll give you all the free time between 6 p.m. And, and midnight that you want to work on your MBA and we'll even give you Sundays off. So, worked on the MBA. Uh, my wife commented that when I'd show up for dinner between working as an engineering director and being an MBA student, my kids would ask, why is daddy at dinner? Um, so, yeah, it was, it was a tough two years, but we made it through. Uh, moved over to Fluke. That was another Danaher company, and I'll talk about some of the learnings there with respect to lean manufacturing. After Fluke, one of my Danaher leaders had moved over to L3, uh, and he was looking for someone to help turn around a business. This was a struggling business that L3 had. They were losing a significant amount of money every year, and they really needed a reinvigoration. So I worked there as vice president of engineering to begin, and two and a half years later took over as president. One of my customers at L3 happened to be General Dynamics, and they had a number of businesses that were, that they were struggling to kind of pull a cohesive strategy together. And so they asked me if I'd be interested in coming and taking over that collection of businesses. We were able to grow those businesses from 2016 to about 2022, from about $500 million to just over a billion dollars uh, in business. So following a, a career at General Dynamics, uh, we decided we wanted to be closer to family. We wanted to be back out in the West. And so I started my own consultancy called E2 Strategies, where I work with small and mid-sized businesses that are looking to thrive and grow inside the defense industrial base. 
So that's what I'm doing now. I spend my mornings skiing, I spend my afternoons uh, working, and it's kind of a nice, uh, this year has been very accommodating for the skiing, so it's been enjoyable. But I'd like to get into some of the things I've learned as part of this journey and, and how those can be applicable to your own journey. And I'm going to try to stay away from being specific to mechanical engineering. It's, you know, it is one of the better majors, but, um, but we use all the majors in the, in, in the industrial base. So starting out with donuts, this is a little video. This is what we made. We made automated donut machines that made high volume donuts. This is kind of a medium volume one. It'll produce about 3,000 donuts an hour. The highest volume ones we made were about 24,000 donuts an hour. So I like donuts, as you can see. Um, and uh, they had me at Donut when they came to campus and were recruiting. I thought that would be fun to make this automated equipment, sell it to people. So the first assignment was go to Taiwan, go to China, find out why we aren't selling our equipment. In, in the mid 90s, China was just opening up as a market and everyone wanted to be there. So we went over there and our partner at the time was McDonald's. McDonald's said, hey, our breakfast sales are struggling. We don't know why, maybe if we introduce donuts, it'll look better. So we set up some focus groups with some folks and we scratched past the surface of kind of the politeness of, of the focus groups where, oh yeah, it tastes great, it's fine, but nobody's buying them. So what we found out was the donuts we were providing were too sweet they were filled with the wrong types of things. And if we adapted and tweaked the recipes to a regional recipe, we would be able to sell more. And so we were able to figure out what that approach looked like. And we were able to identify a strategy and a path to sell those machines uh, more successfully in, in China. But one thing that this company taught me, before I ever went to China, they took me from BYU, they sent me to Kansas State University. I had to go to baking school. For two weeks, I learned how to be a baker. So I was a mechanical engineer. All of a sudden, I'm in baking school with a whole bunch of other bakers. And for two weeks, we made donuts, we made pastries. It was fascinating. It was one of the most fun times I'd had in my career where I got paid to go out and just make cool stuff. Um, but the next thing they did, I showed up at the office with my coat and tie on thinking I'm ready to sell things. And my boss says, go see Big Jim in the foundry. I said, what does that mean? He says, you better take your coat and tie off. So for the next month, I worked from the foundry to the conveyor shop, to the machine shop, to the electrical shop, performing every operation that all the union folks did in that plant, learning how to build our equipment. So for 30 days, I was trained in the building of equipment because the company had two philosophies. Our customers are bakers, we'll be bakers. And you have to know how to build the product you're gonna sell because if you don't, you're gonna be a deficient engineer. So they taught me the value of going to Gemba. And this is a place, if you've taken a lean class, you've probably heard this term, it's where value is created. And that can be on the factory floor, that can be in a customer focus group, that can be in a marketplace, but Gemba is where the real work is done. And this is an important concept. If you're curious enough to go to Gemba in your career, no matter what you're doing, Go to where the real work is taking place. You'll gain insights and value that will drive your solutions further and more, more effectively. And just a tip, Gemba is usually not in a conference room, okay? So as you're out there in your career, be curious. Go out, find out where things are being built, find out how they're being built. You'll be a better engineer for it. So the next turn, we, we got tired of the rain in Seattle. We moved there in September, okay? And it starts raining in September and we left in April, on April 30th, and it stops raining in about June. So it rained on us for the entire nine months. If anybody's from Seattle, you know what I'm talking about, but I'm sorry for, for uh, bringing that up. But it just rained and so we got tired of that. So we went to San Francisco, we went down and I worked for a company that did disaster recovery. And what that meant was if there was a disaster somewhere in the US, we went there and we found businesses, businesses that had lost their information systems, be it paper, hard drives, microfilm. Microfilm was big back then, that's how old I am. Um, so we would go in and every customer we met with, it was always the worst day of their life. 
So their business had just literally been destroyed. And so you're not ever meeting with somebody when they're in a good mood. You're not ever meeting with somebody when they're on, at their best. So what I found was empathy was key in success. And I'll tell you a story. In Grand Forks, North Dakota, the entire downtown business district flooded and then burned. So just, just a horrible uh, combination of events. And I was meeting with a bank president. He had four branches in the town. All four branches had been flooded. And at that bank, they kept their safe deposit boxes and their check processing in the basements. So they had nine feet of really sewer backup, if we're not being polite, in their basements that came up in that flood. And we had to go in and help him figure out how to recover his customers' safe deposit boxes, how to keep them from degrading. But I couldn't get him to focus. And I, so I started talking to him. I started asking, you know, using my missionary skills, asking some find-out questions and seeking to resolve concerns. And what I found out was he was sleeping in a tent at a drive-in theater with his family. He had four kids. His kids wanted to know when they could go home. His home had been destroyed. So getting to that concern and showing empathy and, and working with him through kind of just, this is a terrible event, we were able to get him focused enough that we could put a solution in place for his safe deposit boxes. What we did was we brought cutting torches in and we cut sections of safe deposit box out of the basements. We brought those up through the stairs and we put them into refrigerated trucks and froze the safe deposit boxes and that allowed the customers months of time to come and resolve the contents without having them further degrade. Because by freezing things, we kind of put them in suspended animation. You don't get any algae growth or any fungus. So it was fascinating to work through and solve those problems in real time, but also learning that empathy for our teammates, our coworkers, our customers, is a powerful business tool. It's not just good gospel. Understanding and caring about what your coworkers, what your employees are going through is extremely valuable in motivating, leading, resolving concerns. So empathy, valuable tool. So the next twist, went into pyrotechnics. I mentioned the company offered me to be able to blow things up without going to jail. Question, why pyrotechnics? What do pyrotechnics do? So pyrotechnics are one of the lightest forms of horsepower at their core. You can do a lot of work with very little weight with explosives because you pack both the fuel and the oxidizer together and all you need is a little initiation and you can do things. And basically, we use them to disassemble in a controlled fashion spacecraft. So you see that picture of the Atlas V United Launch Alliance there. All of those things coming off of that spacecraft are controlled pyrotechnically. Very small sometimes, very large. So the space shuttle there, that was a disassembling system. As it flew into space, each of those components had to come off in a very controlled, very reliable fashion at precise time intervals as the space shuttle, shuttle disassembled itself on the way to orbit. Um, pyrotechnics are extremely temperature tolerant. If you've seen Apollo 13, they talk about the pyros and they've been cold for so long. Will they work? Well, all of us in the pyro industry knew they'd work because we're good to minus 200 degrees oftentimes. So they're extremely temperature tolerant. They'll last for 20, 30, 40 years in storage fantastic source of energy and horsepower and extremely reliable. So one of the questions is, how do you release a million pounds in milliseconds? So when the space shuttle lights up, when it's sitting on the pad there, once you've pulled the gantry away, the only thing supporting that shuttle are eight bolts. So those bolts are held down by eight nuts. So the wind loading you get blowing on that, and when you light the shuttle main engines, which I'll show you in a video in a second, the whole shuttle rocks forward. All that stress is just on eight bolts, and they're about three inches in diameter. So each one of those is holding about a million pounds. And when they light those solid rocket boosters, that's when those have to release at precisely the exact time, or you input a moment onto the shuttle, or if one of them doesn't release, you really have a hung bolt, and that's an issue. So you can see that stack of bolts there, the hold down post assemblies. That nut is in there, and those explosive nuts are designed to fracture in a very specific zone. So, you know, when they looked at this, they thought we could do it with hydraulics, hydraulics maybe. We could have it held down and we'll pull back with hydraulics. But when those hydraulics get under load, you have all kinds of interference forces that make it very hard to pull those things apart. So the solution was, let's make these nuts that blow up. 
So in this video, you'll see kind of the sequence of the shuttle main engines igniting, and then you'll see the solid rocket booters, uh, boosters ignite, and simultaneously with the rocket boosters igniting, you'll, those nuts are released. The nuts are underneath a red cover. There's two of them you can see in the picture there underneath those orange covers. That's the, that's the containment system. So you can see the shuttle main engines coming up to full throttle there. You see the mock cones at the exit nozzle. And then those, those nuts release, and that's what allows the shuttle to fly. So if those nuts were to hold on, uh, I'm not sure if the shuttle can lift that pad up, but, um, but it would be a bad day if those nuts did not release. So this was something that was um, exciting to work on. And, and these nuts are now being used, the same system is now being used on the SLS. So the one that just launched the Artemis capsule uh, around the moon a few months ago. So that's a fractured nut. This is after it's been recovered from, you know, that shuttle parachutes down, lands in the water, the motor does, and then you get some salt water in there. So you see the discoloration from the salt water on some of those surfaces. But that's the fractured nut. So this is just one example of the application of pyrotechnics and how they can be used as a tool. And, uh, and you know, pyrotechnics, they're used in oil patch, they're used in aerospace, they're used in your car. And that brings me to the next uh, topic. So in the 1990s, when I began in the pyrotechnic industry, we were just beginning to introduce large volumes of airbags and seatbelt restraints into cars, what we call passive safety devices. And this caused the pyrotechnic industry to go through a bit of a growth transformation where we were mainly making things for aerospace and spacecraft and we were making things in the quantities of tens of thousands a year. We had to go to millions a week to get up to automotive scale. And what happens with a process that's designed to be run 10 times a year and maybe one in a, one in a thousand times you're gonna have a, an ex explosive incident that could harm somebody, you really don't have a problem. But if you run, go from running that 10 times a year to running that 100 times a week and you have a one in a thousand probability you now are going to have an incident every 10 weeks, statistically speaking. And that's what happened to us in the pyrotechnic industry in the late 90s, was we started to see people getting killed or injured because our safety processes were not adequate for the higher volume that we were doing. And it was a painful time to be in the industry because I, I worked as an engineer, but I was also an incident responder. So, because the fire department had no interest in coming onto our plants, if there was an issue, we had to have our own safety response forces. And so when there was an incident, we were the ones that responded. And when you respond to your coworkers being injured or killed, it's tough. It really drove home the need for us to improve our focus on safety. And so the end of the 90s, early 2000s, the state of California, where a lot of these companies were located, basically, they told the industry to take a pause. They said, you need to focus on your safety. You've killed too many people. And we were able to bring in DuPont and their process safety management. And so when you go through your classes and you have the opportunity to study safety, pay attention because because oh, things get dropped sometimes. Um, if that was explosive, it would, be a, would have been a problem. Um, but the process safety management folks were able to help us redesign and rethink how we were approaching these one in a thousand events and make them one in a million events or make them one in a billion events. And that brought almost completely to a halt the number of explosive incidents that were happening in our industry. It was amazing and it made the industry a better place to work and you felt better about what you were doing. So. Pay attention to safety. As engineers, safety begins with us. Whether we're designing a product, a process, if safety isn't at the forefront, rethink your priorities. Because that product or that process will interact with someone. And their safety is critical. Everyone deserves to go home in the same or better condition than they arrived. That was our policy at work. Um, and then secondly, safety goes hand in hand with ethics. And I love the fact that the college has, or the chemical engineering school has put on the safety and ethics conference now two years in a row. Because I think those are so important and they sometimes get understudied as students. So work ethically, surround yourself with ethical people, 
If you find yourself in a situation where you're not working with ethical people, it's a big world. Be curious, go find another job. But life is too short to work in unethical organizations. So from pyrotechnics, the company I was working for was owned by Dan and her corporation. They also owned the Fluke Corporation. If some of you work in the electronics labs, I'm sure you see Fluke equipment in your labs. You see Tektronix equipment in your labs. Those are Fluke products. And they, after my MBA, they wanted me to go and learn about lean manufacturing, about how to produce you know, any product with less waste. And I don't know, I think lean is offered as a course here. You can take a lean manufacturing course. It is the single most powerful tool in industry today for driving profitability and for driving competitiveness as we look at can our factories compete on an international scope? Factories that are, have a lean focus and are led with lean principles can. So the opportunity to go to Fluke, and it was actually here in American Forks, I had an opportunity to come back to Utah for a couple of years, working in that Fluke factory with a team of dedicated professionals that were really, had built their careers around lean and learning the value of applying that business system to everything we did from producing the electronics that we made to our back office processes. Lean has application throughout the value chain. And so uh, take the opportunity to study that as an engineer because regardless of where you're going, the processes you encounter will have opportunities to be improved. So following my stint with Danaher, uh, I was recruited to go over to L3 and they had an operation it was about a $70 million operation. That business was losing $10 million a year. They wanted me to come over as vice president of engineering, but they wanted me to bring the lean approach that I'd studied at Danaher with me and apply that in this factory. So when I got there, I found a group of engineers who felt that they were somewhat removed from the manufacturing of their product. Their job was design. Manufacturing's job was to build very much kind of throw it over the wall, manufacturer will figure out how to build our design. But what I needed to do was convince the engineers we were going out of business. The, the, the mission I was given was fix it, sell it or shut it down. We don't care, just stop the bleeding. We can't lose $10 million every year. So I was able to pull the engineers in, focus them around the finances and say, look, we're gonna do Finance 101 for about two weeks. We got together every other month and we went through how the finances of the corporation worked. Some of them slept, some of them paid attention, but it was important for them to understand that the finances matter for whatever business, whether you pursue, you know, whatever you're pursuing, finances are ultimately what drive the business and what pay the engineer's salaries at that business. And engineering is always going to be serving three competing masters, cost, schedule, and performance. I haven't been able to get away from those three masters in my career. You have to be able to fit your design inside the triangle that's divine, defined by those three. Um, so by working with the engineers and re-engaging them with production, we were able to get our designs back into a state where they could be produced profitably. We were able to take that business right around $70 million, we were able to grow it to about $200 million and return it to profitability in a number of years. And create a lean business that to this day is, is the leader in the fusing industry. Um, so we built warhead fuses, the two pictures there, that's the well, first picture is a picture of a JDAM, Joint Direct Attack Munition, going off in an airburst mode. So that's, that's triggered by a, a proximity sensor that says, hey, I'm getting within so many meters to the ground. The second picture is a small diameter bomb. This is a small 250 pound bomb going through a hardened bunker. So it's a 250 pound bomb with a penetrating bus and it'll pass through about um, you know, a significant amount of concrete. And uh, so that picture there, so those are just a couple of the products that we made there, uh, the trigger devices for fuses. So moving in on to general dynamics, I learned something as we were developing larger systems. We heard a lot, failure is not an option. You've probably heard that if you've seen Apollo 13, failure is not an option, right? They had to bring the astronauts back. In that case, failure was not an option. 
But I'm here to tell you that in engineering, failure has to be an option. We have to fail. We have to test. We have to fail. We have to learn. And the SIOY competition, it was great to see people talking about failing fast, failing forward. Um, failure needs to be an option. And honestly, the U.S. weapon development uh, enterprise has been slowed by the failure is not an option mantra, where we're so afraid to fail in a test because it's visible that we fail to learn. We'll put a test off for six months to get everything right when we could test, learn 90% from that test even if it failed, and we could move forward. So other countries, we find them innovating more rapidly. One of those countries is Israel. They have a clear and persistent threat. They live in a hostile neighborhood with, and they have a very fraught geopolitical situation. I don't want to get into that, but what that does is that drives a very innovative culture. And I'll show you a picture here. When I first started working with Israel, they would receive rocket attacks uh, regularly coming in from the West Bank or from, uh, not West Bank, but from Gaza Strip and, and from the north in Lebanon. And they really couldn't do anything but have sirens and you had 30 seconds to get to the nearest tunnel, you know, to get to a shelter or whatever it was. And I remember being in a car and the sirens would go off and you just get out of the car and you go to a ditch on the side of the road because rockets were inbound. And what that did was that required Israel to really push um, hard, you know, with a kinetic response to stop the rockets. So I'll show you a picture of what happens now. Go! So what you see here, those are incoming rockets and those rockets are being intercepted. The rising rockets are so a system called Iron Dome. And that system was developed by Israel starting in about 2006. And the US government told Israel, look, this thing's doomed to failure. You're not gonna be able to do it. What Israel did was they brought in a team an Air Force team and engineers from the south of the country where they were under persistent rocket attack. These teams were highly motivated because the system would be defending their homes and families. And so they built this system, sometimes going to Toys R Us and buying large quantities of remote control cars to get components out of those cars because they were less expensive that way than going through traditional means. So they put this system together. The interceptors cost about $100,000 a piece which is less than anything the U.S. could produce to do the same mission. And they're able to put these systems around their vulnerable cities and give diplomacy a little bit of time to work when these rocket attacks are coming in. And I remember the first real successful one, they were able to have Egypt broker a ceasefire with Hamas in, in the Gaza Strip as a result of them sitting back and waiting because the population did not feel that they were as threatened. So moving forward, what does a missile defense solution look like for the US? We have the standard missile three, we have ground-based mid-course defense, but these systems, when we talk about a college of engineering, these systems require every discipline in the college of engineering. You have communications, you have radars, you have chemical engineering to create the rockets that the propulsion systems for the rockets. Uh, just a tremendous amount. In fact, I believe these are some of the most complex engineering problems that exist today, is how we put this system of systems together to work. And this system does work. So what you see here, you're basically hitting a bullet with a bullet. Our systems are kinetic kill. They're body-on-body -body intercept. So think about something the size of two basketballs, end on end. Okay, that's that kill vehicle at the top. You have a closing speed of 17,000 miles per hour and you're trying to hit the equivalent of a telephone pole, okay? And that's the target that you see there. You can see the image of the target through the, the kill vehicle sensor. So what you have here is what I believe to be the most complex engineering problem, the control systems that are required there. Those control systems cycle over 2,000 times a second just to move the, uh, the kill vehicle into the right spot. So. Um, there are a lot of opportunities out there. My path has been kind of circuitous, but it's been fun because I've been curious about everything that I've had an opportunity to work with has been fascinating, the way we've been able to solve problems. 
what I would encourage you to do. Be curious, okay? Be flexible. Partner with the Lord in where your career takes you. Let him take you places you didn't think you would go. I never thought that I would bounce to this many different companies and have this many different opportunities. And the people that we've met along the way and the things that we've been able to do have been tremendous and phenomenal. Um, learn to communicate. Pay attention in your English classes. One of my favorite classes here was my technical writing class. I had a great teacher. But engineers that communicate are engineers that get their projects funded. That is often the discriminator. The engineer telling the better story is the engineer that's going to sell his business. He's going to sell his projects. So learn to communicate. Pay attention in English. It matters. I have edited way too many engineering white papers that have been sent to me as a leader to know that we don't have enough engineers that can write well or communicate well. Don't be afraid of engaging in the finances. Be curious about how your business runs. Whether it's your own business, then you'll have to. But even if you're in a large corporation, be curious about how that company makes its money and be a part of bringing solutions that drive that forward. And in closing, it's safety and ethics in all things at all times. That is absolutely critical. That is our responsibility. And it's, it's uh, something that should be at the forefront of your mind in everything you design and touch is how is this going to interact with the people that will be using it. So I want to thank you for the time today. I hope this was valuable. And uh, thank uh, Dr. Jensen for having me. So thank you. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the chance to hear from Eric Ellis today and for uh, his kindness and taking the time out of his day to come here and be present with us here in the College of Engineering. We thank thee for the department that has taken the time to put this together and uh, we thank thee for the various lessons that we have been able to learn together today. Please help us to apply these principles as we go about the rest of our days. Please help us to learn how to be curious and flexible and to partner with the Lord and additionally, please help us to always use empathy as we are continuing on into our engineering careers and help us to uh, always apply principles of safety and ethics and try to invoke the principles of the gospel as we do so. Father, we love thee and please bless those who cannot be with us today. We say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>